just a reminder, if you're watching this episode of The Patch on YouTube, uh, Rooster Teeth first members have the opportunity to watch live as we're streaming the show. Uh, tweet along with us, participate in all that, get the episode a day early, and have access to our Patch post show where we do more patchy goodness every week. If you want a 30-day free trial, the details are below to sign up. Oh, hey, Hello. it's Look, the it's patch. patch. This week brought to you by Battlefield One and Dollar Shave Club. Thank you to our sponsors for sponsoring this episode of the Patch. I'm Gus. I'm Ashley. I'm Ryan. And I'm Gus. So, back um, to the old intimate three person I know. I'd guess, flip you the, guys want to get cozy? The thing is way over there. They all look at it. It's so lonely. <laughs> well, you can just lean over and, and we can just like. There we go. Gonna fall. Perfectly nope, done. Good. There it's we totally go. Totally We're fine. Every We're now fine. and again, we, we like can just check, check in with it out. It. Yeah. See, like, how is the hourglass doing today? So, um, of course, I, I wait. What what day is today? This is the twenty sixth. So, yes. you, did you all talk a lot about PSVR last week? We talked nothing about it after its release. We uh, talked about it the day be- or the week before, but I don't think we addressed it at all last week. Yeah, I. You know what's funny <laughs> is that, it, and this came out, I guess, after PSVR was actually released, and people were messing around with it, but. Uh, one of the main reasons that uh, I've now purchased PlayStation VR is because it will also work with Xbox One. Yeah, what? And I think well, that's you can hilarious. feed anything what? into it. Oh yeah, you can basically treat it as a television, like as a like personal. Oh okay, screen. I assume so yeah. You, like yeah. hook it up so the the output just goes into the uh, PSVR headset instead of to a TV. Not, not not the best use for it. No, it's not the best use for it, but that's not the point. The point is that I can use PlayStation VR on an Xbox, and I think it's hilarious. It doesn't even have. It's a very expensive joke. Yeah. It's a very expensive yeah. joke. But, is, it, uh, is the joke on you or I, it might jokes be. on Sony? They just sold another <laughs> PSVR. Yeah, those suckers. <laughs> um, no, but I, I just like that that you can have that as a screen, as basically a TV anywhere. I think it's mm-hmm. really awesome. Yeah, I mean, essentially, when you're playing and when you're using it, you don't even have to have your TV on. Because even like yeah, it, it has, true. you know, the, the PlayStation menu, the bar, and everything is there. So you, you just leave your TV off. You know, it occurred to me that um, I, <laughs> Microsoft has got to be really sad these days that Connect didn't meet up with VR timelines quite right. Mm. If that were to come out now and have the motion tracking, but you've got a headset on, so what you're seeing is essentially like your hands in the game doing, you know, with all the, the motion and being controlled, like controlling the game that way, it would probably be amazing. But probably, everyone's just but so over the very idea of Connect at this point. That is just dead. I, unfortunately, it, it would fall to the same issues that I think PlayStation VR is having, which is that, uh, and and Oculus may encounter as soon as they release Touch, which is is when you're going off a single camera facing you from this direction, it is so easy to occlude it when you're working in a three dimensional space. If you turn your body sideways, and then suddenly like you you lose part of the tracking. If it can't see mm-hmm. it, and that's the same with Connect, even though it's not looking at anything, but it's trying to track your body. Uh, that hand is now gone. Um, yeah, and you know, it's and it's also working with older technology, like the Move controllers are a couple years old at this point. I mean, that's Connect era. They came motion out in control. 2010. And now, uh, they, they met. Well, that's the original Move. Now it's gotten better because I, I was curious and looked it up. But it it got some improvement with PlayStation camera. Um, but that's it. The Move technology is still 2010. Right. So and it isn't amazing with tracking that stuff. It's adequate, but it's not amazing. Uh, not yet. Uh, so I, I love, I've, I've been having a lot of fun with my PSVR. Uh-huh. I do have some problems with it, and I think it has to do with that tracking and that old, the fact that there is that old hardware powering it. Um, I think out of all of the headsets so far, and I said this after I went to PSX last year, the PSVR headset is the most comfortable. And Easily. I'm, and I'm glad to see that they have not changed that, that you know, the, in this final release, commercial release, that it's still super comfortable. It's the only one I could really picture myself putting on my head and wearing for like two hours. It's, oh, yeah. um, it's largely down to the weight distribution too, because it's... It is the heaviest headset. Yeah, it's, um, uh, let me see if I can recall, it's 1.3 pounds uh, as opposed to 1.24 Oculus, uh, and then I think uh, the Vive might be coming in at one flat, or those two are swapped. Well, either no, way, yeah, the either way, it's the, the heaviest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, but they the way they distribute the weight is it's the only one that for some reason 
had the idea that maybe it's not comfortable to just grab your eyeballs and push them back into your head. Yeah, the, it has the ability. What weird! For the, I know, right? For the the eyepieces to be telescoped in and out. Yeah, which I think is another really cool. Huge and for, that's not for where people the weight with glasses. Sits. Right, the weight does not sit on your face; it sits on your head like a hat. Yeah, and and like you're saying, for like what I don't mm -hmm. feel uncomfortable with my glasses. I can wear my glasses with a Vive or with the Oculus, but it's it's a little clunky. Uh, I feel like with the PSVR, it's not a problem at all. Um, and the 1080 resolution, while not as good, is totally adequate. It's adequate, and I think the 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 bigger problem it suffers from is that the PS4 isn't as powerful as a PC. Yeah, it so doesn't like have the horsepower. All the it. Vive and the Oculus stuff looks much better because it's got you know a much more powerful PC uh, behind it. But uh, it still looks fine. Uh, and I think that I'm most excited still about the PSVR because, and I've said this before, it's made by Sony who've been making games for a long time. So you know that the software support side of things is going to be there. You know, the Vive is awesome, but HTC doesn't make video games. And uh, same with Oculus. It's like a brand new company. They've never really made a game. Though they have made some vague announcement about some kind of experience or game or something. The HTC has yeah. that they're working yeah, on. Yeah, but, but making an announcement isn't the same mm. as, as having a solid history in game development. That's true. We're going to make life great again. <laughs> video games for everybody. <laughs> but the, the so going back to, so now, now that I've heaped all my love and my praise, the thing I don't like, yeah. I'm going back to Say what you give, hate. Earlier. Give, a, give us a hate sandwich. It's, you do some hate and then some more love. The tracking isn't very good. Uh, if you when I, like, I've been playing a lot of keep talking and nobody explodes with my wife. And if you have the headset on and you're looking at the bomb, the bomb is constantly doing at my at my house. The bomb mm. constantly does this. So it's the head tracking specifically that is yeah, moving around. It's like because yeah, you don't play that game. I don't play that game with the move controls. You play that game with the the PS4 controller, uh -huh. and it, the, it's just like constantly shifting around. And so, it's just not tracking correctly. So we did a video in uh, the Until Dawn on rail shooter, which again conceptually was just all over the place. I don't know who thought that was a great idea. It was like, oh, let's just take that Until Dawn property because it's so popular and make it an on rail shooter. Because sure, uh, though the game starts off really weird and then picks up at least into an interesting on rails sort of scary shooter. Well, we're in we're still two. in that early enough space with VR where you're gonna get people trying stuff out that just yeah. doesn't quite. You know, we had the same thing early on with downloadable DLC where you end up with shit like horse armor. Yeah, it's like small stuff that's overpriced and people react to it, dislike it, and then they go try something else and then eventually find a formula that works. But we're still early enough in that process that you're going to get those ones where they decided that was a great idea and then mm -hmm. it well, didn't come out quite right. I don't know that it's if someone decided it was a great idea. Usually what happens there at the beginning is it's like, here, this is a popular title. Find a way to shoehorn VR into it. I'm so pretty sure that's, like, that's in the briefing, right? Is like yeah. shoehorn this shoehorn in. Shoehorn this in. Mm -hmm. Take this and cram it into VR. Cram but, it. Yeah, just get it in there. <laughs> it's not a title that was designed to like, hey, I know VR would be great. It's, hey, make this a VR thing. Um, but there are a lot of uh, PlayStation VR apologists uh, that reacted to this video and uh, some of it is just that I'm, just ha I mean, I'm having fun with the fact that it's not great by just shaking my arms vigorously sometimes to get them back. But it would just lose, slowly kind of lose track. But there, uh, all the, uh, uh, let me just respond to the criticisms directly. I mean, we can talk about it uh, or we can just be honest. Yeah. So um, a lot of people said I didn't recalibrate the arms frequently enough, which I did actually many times. It's just hard to distinguish what the recalibration looks like versus some of the other just pops that it does anyway, uh, that I kept moving back away from the camera, which I was actually doing deliberately in an uh, effort to uh, have more of me in the field of view so I could have right. a wider range of motion and to see if I could find a sweet spot where it had better arm tracking because I was afraid that I, as I was moving around, I, it was losing track of me because the field of view was so tight and I was reasonably close to the camera. Now, at the range that I'm at, which is a little bit different from your experience. Yeah, I'm at home on a couch. So I'm probably like yeah. six to eight feet away, maybe eight feet away. So I'm maybe three feet to uh, my three to five is probably my range there. Um, and the head tracking was reasonably good. I didn't have many issues with what you're talking about like this. And you haven't really, I guess, used the move controllers yet. Uh, there, there's some shakiness there. I've done uh, the London mm -hmm. heist uh, and it was it was a little bit. It wasn't. Yeah. As bad, in my opinion, as, uh, as I experienced with the headset. Uh, so the hands did definitely lose 
that tight feeling that you want, especially if you've played with the Vive, where it's it's pretty dead on almost all the time. Um, they would wander off, and I would lose control of it, especially at very uh, intense moments when you really need to get things to be where they need to be, trying to fight off a boss, and that's when you're going to start making more jerky mov- movements, and that's where it would just start uh, losing track of where I was, and my arm would just be up here somewhere, or it just would slowly wander this direction. Uh, I never experienced anything that bad. Uh, it's, again, it's there's as the pace of the game increases, you start moving more naturally. That's when you want it to be the best. When you're at your most immersed? into the game. Yes, immersed. When you're most immersed in the game, you want it to be dead on, and that's where it really started to lose me. Um, and again, there are other people saying that a lot of that is light-based, like you have to apparently it's very sensitive to the illumination levels in the room which so is So do not, you need a lot of light or a very little light? No, apparently both are bad. So you need medium light. You, there's a good level somewhere in the medium that is where move likes to function. Okay. So I was told frequently that I just didn't light the room properly because most people I imagine have dimmers, I guess, in their living room so that they can precisely calibrate the light for the move. Alexa Set lights <laughs> to PlayStation VR. Down five lumens, please. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, what do you think? Did you guys hear about the the new announcement? Microsoft announced a Windows 10 compatible VR headsets. Mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't watch that announcement, but I read a little bit about it after the fact. Yeah, so, so it's going to be inside out tracking. So it's going to be more along the lines of the Oculus Rift Santa Cruz headset they announced, where instead of needing like the Vive Lighthouses, it's going to be tracking from the headset to other stuff. Which so is like, very HoloLens. That's how the HoloLens yes. works, essentially. Yeah. Um, but that it is a <clears throat> VR, not augmented reality like the um, HoloLens. Oh, mm-hmm. um, and starting it, they want to start at like 300 bucks, and they're working with a bunch of partners to create them. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm not entirely sure like what their aim is there, except that everyone needs to have a VR headset now. Uh, I mean, I, it doesn't seem also from what I read that they weren't going to be manufacturing it, right? That it did no, seem like um, they were external like partners. Acer's working with Starbreeze on one. Um, Asus uh, is working on one. Um, HP and Dell haven't announced so anything. Then but what, if, if they're not making it, what is their level of involvement? Did they develop like Windows some of the tech? Windows 10 compatible, Yeah, they're, maybe? they're working it on... It might be inc- the, the same sort of relationship that, say, Valve and HTC have with the Vive, where they're working with them on software compatibility and all that, but that the the hardware manufacturers are the ones making the headsets. They're, I think they're building in core functionality into Windows 10 and several Windows 10 apps okay. to support a VR environment. Okay. That's pretty much it. Uh, it seems like they want it to go mainstream, which, yeah, it's interesting that Microsoft is jumping into this. Um, and I, I thought that they were really going, I, like, you know, all in on augmented reality. So this was... I, I was kind of surprised by I, them uh, jumping on the VR bandwagon. I think, if in, in my speculation, that they so missed the boat on mobile phones that they do not want to miss another big mm. consumer electronics thing. So Find they're just going to the make sure they're on all, get of, on all of them. All the boats. No boats. No ferry leaves without Microsoft <laughs> on it. I mean, they, they sank so much money into trying to catch up on phones, and they never were able to. So I think that this is, this makes sense, and they don't, they don't want to fall horribly behind. Well, if you think about it, it's it's also a great way to leverage some of the technology that they worked on for HoloLens, yeah. that inside-out tracking, um, and, and use that in a product that is more viable now. Uh, HoloLens is a great idea, but I don't think they found a market for it yet. And well, they can take some of that. it's also not commercially available yet. Right. I mean, you can buy a dev kit, but it's not commercially available, I don't think, because they have no... There's no use case. Commercial niche for it to go into. It also may still be very difficult to produce. Like, you know, the the individual mm-hmm. uh, dev kits they were selling was, what were they selling them for? Something three like $3,000? Oh, what was it? Three? Wow. 3, yeah, 000. it was a lot. And they still are selling them, I think. You can still buy one, I believe. At least you could not that long ago. But so if they just take the inside out tracking that is part of that, uh, offload all the onboard computational abilities, you keep the, the accelerometer data. Uh, and you just have a screen that you don't even have to worry about transparency on, you've just built a much cheaper version of the HoloLens that is currently uh, market-worthy. Like, Mm -hmm. it's something that people will want. Yeah, and I think they said that these headsets were going to start at $399, if Uh, I recall. $299. $299? $299. Holy shit. Yeah, so that's definitely a lot cheaper. They've already, I mean, they buried all the the opportunity cost of, or uh, the uh, the manufacturer and development cost 
I guess, into the HoloLens technology. So right. now they just got to make the thing. Yeah. The research cost, at the very least. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so they're not operating quite at the level of uh, Google's new headset, which is, what's it called? Um, Daydream. Daydream, which is, I think they're launching at, like, $80. Yeah, it's super, super but cheap. Yeah, they're, they want So they're trying to fall somewhere in the middle there where it's not 80 bucks. It's more than that, but it's also not six to 800 bucks. It's also, I mean, the Google's new thing is not going to do that sort of tracking, I don't think, is no, it? No, and I think it's, no. th- it's also... Like for smartphones, like it doesn't have yeah. a display in it. You put your phone in it. It's basically just a mainstream version of uh, cardboard. The, yeah, well, sort of cardboard, probably it's more cardboard, on, online. Except it's with fabric the, now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fabric. Please, but they, me. they decided Cloth. calling it that the the Google Fabric just didn't sound cool enough. It's it's probably a, a mainstream competitor for the Oculus. Uh, oh, oh, here phone. we are. Gear. Gear. Yeah. yeah, God, slip my mind. Oculus phone. Yeah, the Oculus phone, the Oculus basically. Phone, well, I mean, this, it's what it is. <laughs> hey, strap a bomb to your face. Samsung and Oculus. I love that they dropped support for that. <laughs> poor, poor Galaxy, man. In fact, uh, did you guys see the DMCA takedown Samsung issued against the GTA 5 mods uh-huh. that, yeah. that turned the bomb into a Galaxy Note 7? <laughs> That's so that's so messed up. You that's all. I mean, like, it's, it's funny because it's ridiculous, but if you stop to think about it, you're like, that's not remotely what DMCA is Actually, for. What the terrifying. fuck? That's, that's awful. awful. Yeah, that's terrible. You can't stop the signal. <laughs> yeah, people, people are going to be making Hack jokes the about it. Uh, <laughs> I know, can move your reference too, you know. You, yeah, it's very good. Thank you. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this episode of The Patch is brought to you by Battlefield 1, which just came out uh, this past Friday, right? Yep. Yep. Um, I, I talked about it a little bit on the podcast on Monday. Unfortunately, I have not had a chance to play it. I've been out of town. For a long time. Oh, it's pretty. I'm looking forward to checking it out. Um, it's interesting to see uh, an FPS take place in World War One. I. I feel like it's something. I think that it's going to start a trend of maybe experimenting with di- mm-hmm. more diverse settings. You know, we've seen World War Two. We've seen modern to death. So it's interesting to go back and play World War One. So can you play? I keep hearing people talk about this. Is there a mode where you play as a pigeon? Yes. Yeah. Well, War pigeons. I mean, War pigeons is a multiplayer game type where I think you just collect the pigeons yes but and there's a level in the, the campaign where you play yes. as a pigeon there is one section of a ca- of in the campaign it's in the second uh well so the first story block and the story is actually uh, very interesting i've only played the first two parts so far but it's interesting in that it, it's got a good kind of emotional weight to it um and it it takes place over different characters so it's not like you have one contiguous story other than it is the story of the war and those that Right, we're so in like, it. So like each war story is like a vignette of yeah. of like one like one person or like one experience, and then it will jump to another theater. And so you mm-hmm. you get to cover a lot of ground uh, and a and a lot of different characters, a lot of different perspectives on the war. Interesting. But and yeah, one of the, at one, one point of you release a pigeon, a pigeon and it has to fly. It's a pigeon perspective, the bird's eye view of the battle. <laughs> um, so uh, and also we talked about this on the podcast on Monday. The uh, Gavin and Dan, the slow mo guys, filmed a video just the other day for. Uh, for Battlefield 1, and we can't wait for that to come out. I don't know when that's coming out, but hopefully it's here pretty soon. Soon. Uh, so anyway, uh, Battlefield One's available now. Uh, you can purchase and download. So check out the link in the description below. It's battlefield.com. Thank you, Battlefield, for sponsoring this episode of The Patch. Um, what was I talking about? I was going to say something else from there. PlayStation so talking VR. About pigeons, talking about we were talking about. The $80 Google VR. I don't know. But uh, Is there anything else I want to say about P- Oh, there was something else I want to say about PSVR. I was... It, it, it's it's funny um, when you receive it. It's very well packed. It's very mm-hmm. well presented in the box. You're like, wow, this is very cool. And then you very quickly realize there are a lot of cables. There's to so plug many in cables. Here. It's like a Medusa. And suddenly you get out the box, and there's two cables that go in this end, and a little bit slides back slides. and forth. Yeah, I wasn't and you expecting put that. The cables in the other side. But it was all. I thought it was very straightforward. I thought the instructions were very clear. I thought all of the cables were very well labeled. I was very impressed with the presentation and the way that the box was put together. And I don't know if I'm the only person in the world who thought who was like, oh, wow, I really like this box. I felt uh, very comfortable with putting it together. It was very clear where each of the different pieces went. They're, you know, they're they're color coded. They've got their, Ooh, frankly, no, kind of cheesy um the the cheesy four symbols to make sure that you plug things in and all align to the the right directions and everything uh so that's all really easy to understand for sure what got me about opening and unpacking it was i was just like keep adding more cables to it and be like this is this is getting really intense Mm -hmm. to not just like plug it into the console and it works Mm -hmm. there's a lot going on there i do have one 
criticism about how they decided to lay out the headset. Um, and again, I know it sounds like we're saying a lot of negative things, but on a whole, I, I do want to, again, mention that it is by far the most comfortable and the, the screen is okay. Um, so that's what it's got going for it. It's an experience that's not wholly not worth having. Um, but the cable that comes off the headset is maybe four feet long um, and then plugs into an extender box or that goes into a longer cable that they can run further away. I would have preferred that that... It'd be swapped so you have a longer cable from yeah. the head. I would it, agree. Right now there's a, a junction box within three or four feet of you, which is great, I suppose, if you're sitting down or it's okay if you're sitting down. Um, but there are standing experiences for that game, which means that you're just having that connection, if you're my height, just dangle. Uh, and it's just two cables plugged into a box, just kind of swinging free. If I step on the cable and move my head, I'm going to just yank it right out. Um, and I think they could have reversed that and had a much better product. It would have made sense, too, to have that junction box be close to the console. Or not even have it at all. I mean, that's uh, with this kind of setup, it's already going through the junction of the external box or the additional processing unit. Um, so that if you're going to make it on the other side, there's really no point to even make it. It's, I don't know why they didn't make the so one. that I can plug it into my Xbox. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but yeah, so overall, I'm 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 happy with it. What the hell is this? Um, Have uh, you actually plugged it into your Xbox yet? No, I brought it into the office because my my setup at home is pretty complex. I like I'm going through a receiver for. I've got two setups at home. Both of them go through a receiver, mm -hmm. uh, and then one of them I have to like tunnel up behind wood to get to the TV. <laughs> Uh, because it's like the the people who lived in the house and designed their their you know the, the home theater setup were not thinking of things like accessibility and future proofing and someone wanting to move cables around later on. So it's like a really involved process to they hated do anything. Technology. And uh, in the other setup, the it's it shares a wall with the kitchen, and so you actually access the console from a kitchen cupboard. Uh, hmm. And then, but, huh. and it all goes through to the wall that's in the living room. So I have to go through a wall to get to anything. So that's actually Are really, you a ghost? Yes. I am a ghost. And you see dead people. <laughs> Movie quotes. Yeah. Uh, so, like, they're both kind of weird setups. And I figured it'd be easier to test all of that stuff out by bringing it into the office. And so I've got it out in the car uh, to fiddle with it. Uh -huh. I'm really curious what that setup looks like if you're plugged into something else can you change the screen size like what how flexible is it in modifying signals that are from non playstations mm -hmm. well we can go mess with it yeah we should try it out it, it probably it's probably not very forgiving because it shouldn't have to be yeah it knows, yeah, it's it, not it, what it's made for right. well, it, I mean, it, if you're it should know it, what to expect if you're going to include that well i mean just can i how dynamic is it can i make the screen big mm -hmm. like if you're going to make that environment where i have a fake environment with a screen that is showing other content. I would expect, at least, though, I could make it like, do I feel like watching it on a movie screen? How I long feel like until we have like microtransactions where you can like buy a new screen virtual size. space? Oh, I'm, I'm, it already, exists. already exists. Yeah, I'm yeah, I think virtual desktop sells, uh, which is. But just, for our, for our PlayStation VR cinematic experience, like, how much is it going to cost for me to like upgrade my pretend living space? <laughs> or if you could have, um, for movie watching, if like you buy. Uh, the ability to stream the Avengers if it reskins everything else like you're in like a Stark lab or something. Oh, that would be oh, awesome. What if they could sit next to you? Right. What if you could have the Avengers in the theater with you? You look over and there's just Tony Stark or, being like, this guy's a jerk. Or that, <laughs> if they have like cast commentary, then they start talking and like the commentary <gasps> comes from their models that are around. Yeah, I think you just blew Ryan's mind. You just sold me so many <laughs> things. Make that happen, somebody. See, I got, I got ideas. I think about that's a 360 camera, stuff. and you're good to go. Just put it in there and do the commentary. Mm -hmm. yep. Sit on the couch, relax. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's everything I had to say about PSVR. I think I've exhausted my 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 PSVR discussion you've, for the you've week. You've been away for weeks. You've got to have so much stuff. So I, yeah, I've been up. away, but I haven't been playing games because I've been on the road. So that, that's why, like I, I mentioned earlier, I haven't played Battlefield 1. I haven't played Gears. I haven't played, uh, what's another one I want to play that came out? Civ? Civ, I haven't played yeah. Civ yet. Oh my god. I haven't touched it yet. I want I, to. I accidentally went on a Civ bender over the weekend. Are you or have you been a big Civ player in the past? Uh I play Civ here and there. I understand 
like what a what a time sink it is and how risky it is to get really into it. So um, I play here and there, but I've never gone in and done like campaign after campaign after campaign. Uh, I'm I'd say the state game I played the most was actually Civilization Revolution mm, because that it was, was a, great one. a lot faster to get through games. It was streamlined. It was a little bit simpler. Um, and it was also easy to just like do like on the couch as a mm -hmm. lazy person. But um, on Saturday morning, I started playing it. Like I'll check it out. Looking forward to it. Really excited. Uh, I was up until five the next morning playing mm -hmm. it. In one day, I played 16 hours of Civ. It's the it's very, very good still at that like i just need to have this unit do this thing so just need like the one more turn and then i need to do another thing otherwise i'll forget next time i like, go to sit down and play and then another thing and another thing and another thing and before you know it i've hit the modern era i i bought it launched the game got to the ruler selection screen and went ah oh, fuck and just started reading through it. i was like i, I i'll come back to it yeah i did it actually stopped me dead there just looking at all the options so you talked about, um, you know, getting like getting one more action, one more action, getting your, your a troop or a, a unit to do something. And uh, I attended a panel about civilization at DICE earlier this year. And they were talking about how with Civ Five, since it had like Steam integration, they were able to monitor people's playing habits a lot more. They, you know, they knew how long people were playing, what they were doing. And they said that what surprised them was that a lot of people, whenever they play, they always start a new game. They said that they realized that since the game can be so complex, if you save it and then step away, when you come back, sometimes you're like, oh, I don't remember exactly what I was doing. Who was I mad at? You know, what was yeah. my goal on my tech tree? Yeah, where was I sending all my units? What was I researching? Like, which victory was I going for? Yeah, so lots of times that people just start a new game and then go, go wow. from there. Which yeah. is crazy to me. I've, I've never thought to do that. I have to play my game to completion. Yeah. And then that's it. I'll move on to my next, to my next playthrough. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, it's it's good. I don't. The art style is very different from mm -hmm. Civ Five, which um, I've a lot of been people very seeing, upset about. seeing messages from a lot of people, and we, you know, we knew before launch that people were upset about the change in art style. That it was very polarizing. Uh, I feel like the developers per justified themselves perfectly well, saying you play the game mostly zoomed out. So by stylizing mm -hmm. it, the different units are more easily recognizable. You know, when they're when they're smaller, which. Yeah totally understand great i also i don't mind it because i liked civilization revolution so much yeah. and it's that same kind of frankly cartoony uh end of the spectrum in terms of art style so i wasn't shocked by it as much as i think a lot of other civ people were i don't mind the look i do spend the entire time zoomed out as yeah. far as possible yeah, and i'm like you know it'd be great is if i could zoom out more <laughs> see you know have an even better idea where everyone's at mm -hmm. So I don't mind that that much. There's one thing that really fucks me off about the game, though. It does not have Steam Cloud support. It doesn't. It does not. That's not good. One of the things that one of the things that bothered me about Civ Five was that by default it saved your stuff local. You had to like click on a different tab to tell it to save on cloud. So it, it's weird to me that they had that functionality and then they don't have it again. They don't have well, it anymore. Reportedly, they've moved it so that uh, cloud saves are handled via a 2K account. Oh God. And so you can do that and then have it, but that's in that is nobody bullshit. wants to do that. No, just no. Do it on what Steam. that is. It's this is like it is distributed primarily on Steam on PC. Why would you not support cloud saves, especially because this is a game that takes so long to play that it'd be nice to be able to take it with you. I have a PC at home. I've got. Well, you can. You just got to do two K account. Ugh, no. Nobody wants to make more accounts. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to. Go jump through more hoops. It's a feature. It's already in the it's fucking. Right there. It's there. You know, I'll go ahead and tell you this, 2K, and anybody else thinking of doing this sort of thing. You can require me to do that, but you're not going to get any information that will put you in contact with me ever, ever. unless you think I my name is QT that lives on F Street and my birthday is 1901. Why would you give out your personal information like that, Ryan? I mean, I'm just putting it out there. Plus the email, it's fake. Yep. Linked, you have to link your 2K account and it'll give you the option to cloud save. Fuck off. No, nah, that sucks. You get my third tier, tier email is what you get. The one that still works shockingly uh, from AOL. AOL account? That's, that's, Ryan, that's, that's how far of, back it goes. Impressive. I've moved on. It's still there. Do you ever just check on those accounts to see like what I the do. hell is in them? To be like, this is 
crazy. After, after, Once in a while, I'll go just unsubscribe from everything that arrives at it. After uh, Yahoo announced that email hack a couple of weeks ago, I was like, oh, yeah, I've got an old Yahoo account I never use. I guess I should go change the password. So I went and changed the password. I was like, oh, right. There was like Yahoo Mail. Like, let's take a look at what's in here. It's like an email address I never really used. And it's like tens of thousands of spam messages. Like, I don't know how they got this email address. I, I never really used it. Oh, well, they, they hack Yahoo. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> Sign me up for fucking email. Well, that's the best email to have because that's the one you just throw at anybody that wants your email that you really don't want to have. Your yeah, it's email. like okay, if I have to click a link and verify something, mm -hmm. it's there. But there you go. I'm not going to see anything that goes mm -hmm. in there. You have sold me nothing, so, um, sir. Um, it's not binary on Twitter. Uh, says I don't think I've completed even ten Civ campaigns, but I've started hundreds. Wow. So. It's got to be really cool for developers, honestly, to have w with the everyone being more or less always connected with the games they're playing now. To be able to get that kind of data and see how people are playing their games. Is that not weird to Before you, though? That, well, sure, it's weird. But it's like from a development standpoint, I'm sure they're loving having that kind of access because... Before the internet, you would just have to ask people and then hope that they tell you and hope that it's an appropriate sample size to actually figure it all out. But this, we can see with beyond any shadow of a doubt yeah. what people are doing. It's very similar to like online advertising and how different that is from advertising on television where they're pulling a family of people and saying, what did you watch and did you see stuff? And that's the equivalent. Whereas online advertising, you know exactly how many impressions, how many people watched it, how long they stayed. Every, it's very, very detailed. Like online tracking has revolutionized all that stuff. You know exactly what people are doing. And from a development perspective, that gives them a chance to when, optimize and say, you know, well, maybe... It teaches them like what what is important to people. Like as a developer, you may have a certain idea of what is going to be important to the player in the game. But when you put the game in the player's hands, you're like, oh, no, this is... the this is the other thing is what was really important. But so I'm can glad I say for that no to that? Like, what if I don't want you to know everything I did? Well, I'm sure you unplug your internet. Can. Unplug your yeah. internet. Well, that I, uh, a lot of these games you can't start without having some kind of back end connection. Well, on Steam, you can these days, right? Steam is, eh, it's got an offline mode, but it's kind of hit or miss. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm lazy enough that I just leave it. I always, whenever I have the software installed, I'm like, hey, you want to send offline tracking data to help better the product? I'm like, mm. I say no. <laughs> I have it. I say no. Yep. I don't know what you're going to do with that. I don't know what it can see on my computer. You might find all my porns. All of them? All my porns. <laughs> I have kids. I'm not allowed to have porns on my computer, to be honest, but I still don't Is want them to see like it. Is that when you just like put them in an unlabeled folder? That's a great idea, but it sounds like there's something they would find. No, that's when you put it in like safety there you go. Like, it's like you put it in Windows, the, like, safety brochure. system, drivers, unlabeled folder, hidden folder, porns. Way back, <laughs> way back in the day, um, I don't think this works anymore. Uh, I haven't had to do this in a long time. But uh, before OS X, I think like back when Macs were like System 7, 8, 9, you could... Was it 9? Was, there was no 9. 7 and 8. Um, you could name a folder space. Oh. Like a space bar. And you could change the folder's icon to be like a one pixel by one pixel Just a dot. black dot that like matches your background. So what I would do is I would take all my porn, put it in that folder, and then like rename another folder to be like, instead, instead of system, it would be space system. So then I'd put the empty space at the end of it <laughs> and lined up with it so it didn't look like there was anything else there. It's like I knew if I clicked just a couple of pixels to the right of system... There was hidden porn right there. <laughs> <laughs> what an elaborate a lot stash. A lot of effort to keep your porn secret. It was very secret. Uh, no, that's precisely the right amount of effort to hide your porn stash. You want it accessible but hidden. Yep. That's why under the, the mattress is so prevalent. Right? <laughs> Not anymore. Yes, no, under the mattress. No, but where we all keep it. Yes. The, the thumb drive under the mattress. The porns. Yes, so now, now it's thumb drives. Your kids don't know how easy you got Now it. you just don't need to save it. You just you find new stream. porn yeah. every day. Yeah, back then, back in my day, it was a it was a it was a very different world. Or you just play Kindred Spirits on the roof. <laughs> there was not no that that took way too much effort to get to the sexy parts. That's what makes it worth it. So no, I'm it's not, really that, not. I, don't, I can't back that up. I but don't here that on, is we true. found we found. I mean, you know, we found so many other games for you now. We can mm, date tanks, mm -hmm. dinosaurs. There's a BDSM visual novel. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. You just, can learn to love of strict nature. Yeah. Okay. 
Ryan's so, all about it. Uh, other news that we probably haven't talked about or that you probably haven't talked about is uh, it's clapping. the Nintendo console has a name. Oh, yeah, the Switch. The Switch, the yeah, Switch. That, uh, that was announced like the day after last week's patch, so we didn't get to talk about it on last week's episode. I am genuinely excited about it. Really? I can't believe I'm saying that. It looks cool. I want it. Why? I want to play. I like the idea of being able to take it with you. and Because and, I liked my 3DS. I played a lot of games with it. Uh, and I like the idea of just having that continuity where you can be playing the exact same thing from home on the road. Like I was talking about, I was traveling all this time. If I could have taken... You could have taken that with you and been obviously playing Obviously, Nintendo, I couldn't be playing Gears. But if there was a game that was out or coming out that I really wanted to take with me, it would be no problem. Because that's me on the plane playing the fucking there Switch. It's going to be me. <laughs> You're flying. In about a year. And you, just got, you decided to play Skyrim. You yeah right. Assuming it actually comes out for that system because Nintendo came well, out after it was in the, the ad. The, I know, and then they came out after the fact and where they and uh, Bethesda was like, we don't we we're not confirming any specific games. Well, it's but there's still there, such a weird thing. It's like, look, remember that game that was beautiful like a decade ago? It's great. It runs on our system now. Well, but, what it comes down to is like this was decade, very much a like a vision like, trailer. Which yeah. is like, they, they're they like, here's all the things that would be really cool to be able to do. Uh, people have, of course, since then had enough time to go over the entire trailer, like, frame by frame, and and see exactly how Skyrim is superimposed. It's not playing there, it's not even in the TV, it's like they put oh, it yeah, in after course. the fact. Wait, 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 so it's a vision trailer, which is them saying what they'd like to be at, you're, it's a lie? Remember, They're just lying do you, do you, to you? Like, you know what? It would be great. They're just showing Ryan, examples. Do you remember the Kinect trailer? Uh, and there's one that when the kid like holds up his skateboard and like scans it in and then he's like, whoa, great. look, he's like using the skateboard in the game. And there's a girl being like, no, I'm going to pick out a different outfit for today. Uh, to be fair, though, I will say there is a slight difference there where that's, that was conceptual stuff. And this was like, you can play Skyrim. Well, Skyrim. maybe. Skyrim. Skyrim. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I guess they're going more that it's the the idea that you'll be able to play all this different stuff. And I mean, Skyrim's going to come out on it, right? But they caught up to five years ago. <laughs> they have announced a number of third-party partners that are going to be supporting and the Switch. And Bethesda is one of them. Bethesda is on that list. Uh, At least show Fallout 4. Come on. Well, I mean, that would be probably like Skyrim Special Edition. I, I think Cause they're, yes, they, that's, they've assumed that's what that it Bethesda is. Because that's pumping now since that comes out this week. But even then, I mean, it is a, a very pretty title, but it's still reasonably, compared to newer games, I don't think they upped the poly count or anything. It's just they've upped the shaders and a lot of the uh, texture quality. But it's still not 100% what a game today would look like. Show me Battlefield 1. I, I, I'm just people I just, dancing over there for see, okay, so here's the, the initial Kinect trailer. This was amazing. I forgot about this until you said it, which made no sense because the kid's also because like his were hands in the were in the, eye, way. In the yeah, way. Yeah, he's like, look, now I'm on a skateboard. Oh my god, I got my own skateboard. It's like a real skateboard, but I can pretend to ride it instead. I yeah, totally forgot about this. It's terrible. That it was real bad. Uh, it was. I mean, you know, it was. I. It was very ambitious. Yeah. Vision um, that just never quite got there. So that's the only reason that I have. I'm trying to hold back a little the, bit on the hype train. The thing, I'm mostly on the hype train. The thing but I'm, I'm trying mostly to, excited about trying to, you know, is pull back a little bit. All the rooftop parties I'm going to be invited to once <laughs> I have a switch. I'm and gonna, if you ever go out and decide to play basketball, but then you're like, you I'm can staying stop playing at the basketball, basketball court, you're tired. but I'm going to keep playing basketball. Yeah. See, yeah. that that'll be me. Yeah, it's I. I mean, I I like the taking on the go. Uh, one thing that it that's going to be a problem is that I. One thing that's great about the 3DS is that it's a clamshell design, so the screen's protected mm -hmm. at all times, whereas that's not going to be the case here, so you're going to have to get a case or whatever. I'm, I'm not terribly worried about that, because I feel like my my phone or a tablet already takes a lot of beating and really doesn't I mean, you're talking scratches. about a screen, <laughs> I have, though. I have to put that shit in a case, though, otherwise it gets, like, I've already broke my new iPhone screen. I, you this have? I, I, I only put a case on it for the battery, but there's no case on the front. True, but it's the screen is still protected by the other edges because if yeah. you drop it, yeah. But for years, it I didn't take use the impact. These. I just started using this like a year ago. Fuck and it. by the nature of the oh, oh wow, wow. wait, is, don't you have an extra battery? Ride and bareback. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. the reason I use it. Um, so the screen is a little bit bigger, I think, than your typical uh, phone, though, right? It's going to be a little bit more 
like it the, looks like it from seems the like things, have any dimensions. It's kind of like this. Um, not official dimensions. There have been. It's hard at this point to separate the leaks from the official announcements because there have been oh so many leaks. Mm. Uh, I don't believe they've given official details on the screen size. Well, and because of the nature that it. Yeah, it's a kind of a transformer. You've got those things that slap on the yeah. side. That's going to uh, really limit what you can cons? do. The Joy Cons, sure, those. And it seems like, you know, the obvious thing is that they're, they'll ideally have different ones that you can swap out. Mm -hmm. you know, well, you mean cases or controllers? Or like Probably different, controllers. Yeah. different bits of the Joy Cons. So right. you say like maybe this will, game will come out that needs some Bizarro controller, and there you go. So Ars, Tec think Ars Technica, real fast, just to go uh -huh. back for a second. Ars Technica has. Uh, an estimate of how big they think the screen is based on the, photos and yeah. stuff that they've seen. And they estimate uh, the Nintendo Switch to have roughly a 6.5-inch screen. So that's diagonal. Yeah, so I think this this is a 13-inch laptop. So it would be like a quarter of yeah of my uh, display. But the, uh, the big thing big. is going to be the yeah. difference in resolution from the 3DS now. Because the 3DS is like 240 pixels by 800 pixels, something like that. It's not high res. Uh, and so this is going to be like four times the resolution. Well, not quite four, but it's going to be, you know, several times the resolution of the current 3DS, which is... So HD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At actually, last. I mean, they're, yeah, I believe it's uh, they're targeting 1080p, 60 frames a second, but that's when it's docked, which is still up in the air as to whether that will add any power or not. That's an interesting question. I mean, it looks like... That'd be. I suppose you could have like an exterior GPU or something. Maybe. Yeah, people, I mean, that's not uncommon with laptops. And people thought that you know before mm -hmm. it was confirmed, they, they thought the external unit on the PSVR was going to be something to add more horsepower. Turns right. out it wasn't. It's just for the two D processor. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if it's do if it's handling the two D image, then it is sort of a second. Yeah, but it's not adding like more power for the three D side of things. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, I'm read this real quick. Uh, guys, you don't need to choose between price and quality to get an amazing and affordable shave. DollarShaveClub.com's the answer. To prove how amazing their shave really is, right now they're going to give you your first month free to join the club. DollarShaveClub.com delivers amazing razors right to my door for a third of the price of what the greedy razor corporations charge. I get the first class shave when I use the executive blade. When I use it with their Dr. Carver shave butter, the blade just gently glides for the smoothest shave ever. Here's your chance to see why over 3 million members like me love Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club is so confident in the quality of all their products, now you can get the first month of the club for free. Just pay shipping. After that, it's just a few bucks a month, no long-term commitment, no hidden fees. There's just no reason not to do it. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash patch. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash patch. Thank you to Dollar Shave Club for supporting this podcast. Yeah. Um, so one one other thing that's come up that I feel like we should uh, talk about is reviews. Oh, before we get to that, can I say one more thing about the Switch? Yes. Um, last thing, I swear. Uh, I think that the pe people who are not on the hype train, investors. Because I think yeah, leading, really? that was uh, really weird. Leading up to the 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 NX reveal, we didn't know it was called Switch at the time. Leading up to the NX reveal, Nintendo stock went up four point six percent when added, they announced the announcement. Yeah, they added a billion dollars in market value. Then they announced the Switch, and they dropped seven point one percent. So it's like they had this huge run up, which is you know to be expected. That's stupid. Uh, people are speculating, so they're trying to mm -hmm. jump on. But that the fact that it went down even more. After the fact, is awful. Well, and the the criticisms were fascinating. Um, so some of the criticisms I think were well founded. <laughs> uh, so one of them was uh, that they doubted the widespread appeal, and they weren't sure who besides Nintendo hardcore fans would buy the Switch, which is is valid. I think uh, the Wii U probably has some people a little bit skeptical. Um, you know, with with Nintendo the last couple of years, so that one I can understand. But another one was that it's uh, that it was largely what was speculated. Like, how the fuck was that Nintendo's fault? Nintendo hasn't said anything yeah. about this console. Nothing. The only thing they ever said was that uh, was at E three. They were like, "We'll talk about this, but not right now." Mm -hmm. They've never said anything about it. So basically, the investors were disappointed that it was 
exactly what was leaked? Yes, yes. This meets my expectations perfectly. How I am dare. No disappointed. Um, yeah, you so, did not blow me away, sir. So I found that to be really interesting. And then one of the other ones was that it wasn't very innovative. Like, it is the first home slash handheld console with, you know, that has, like, all these bits that, you know, connect and disconnect and reconnect in various configurations in order to be able to be both, you know, a full console and a handheld. It's the first one that's ever done that. It's not being like, excuse me, we've raised the resolution on this. We are now almost, almost at 1080p. <laughs> it's, I just don't understand... I, I mean, is it the powerhouse technically? No, probably not. But from design and trying to do something new and different, saying it's not innovative, fuck off. I guess the closest thing it would. I can I'm really think upset of at everybody today. Yeah, everyone, yeah, today, today, today everyone Just can get tell fucked. Them. Investors, uh, the Shield tablet was uh, sort of in the same zone, though it did not have attachable and detachable controllers, but it was a. A gaming device in its own right that was also capable of streaming more robust titles from from the a, cloud. A, yeah, well, from a yeah a, a LAN environment. Mm -hmm. um, it also had a cloud service. No, did it? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, as far as like powerhouse built into a smaller form factor device, yeah, it's it's interesting. But Nintendo likes to bank it on a gimmick, and the gimmick sometimes works really well, and sometimes it doesn't. Like the two screen thing, that was a gimmick. The touch screenness of it, uh, those were gimmicks, and they worked out really well for their mobile market. I, I wonder if people are concerned though that they're seeing the death of the existing mobile devices because you mean this death like they'll stop 3ds. Well, right. That I could see investors selling because of that, because essentially they're taking two product lines and then just merging them into one. So you're not selling. Yeah. You're one like product line they've done very well, and one product line they've not done yeah, very okay, well. Yeah, okay, I could see that. You got me. I'm drinking the Ryan Kool-Aid. There we go. <laughs> All right, anyway, it's I'm sure we'll see a lot. I'm, I'm, and uh, the other thing I was surprised about was, despite the fact they revealed it and they unveiled it, there was still, in my opinion, a lack of information. Mm -hmm. Yes. Considering it's coming also, out so soon. And they also have no intention of making any more announcements or offering any more details this year. Yeah. Buy it or don't. So they probably we'll, don't want to compete. So with it's like coming out March. They probably don't want to pay for advertising during Christmas holidays since they're going to miss it anyway. Mm -hmm. that's, I assume that's why they'd wait. But it just seems to, weird to not have further information at this point. It, it is weird to have a console coming out with no real concrete details, specs, that sort of stuff, officially announced until three months before yeah. it hits. PS4 and Xbox One both had separate events before E3 to unveil their consoles. Mm -hmm. And I think th both of those launched, you know, like eight months later. So it's like seven or eight months before the launch, mm -hmm. they had their big event and they answered all the questions. Yeah, of course, that said, Nintendo's <coughs> sales tend to go a little bit differently <coughs> in that they have less of a focus on day one than other platforms and more of a focus on just an extended Tale. I think I well, read some of that uh, is they with, just with can't. their games at least. Well, yeah, the hardware I, too, because they can't manufacture it fast enough typically. And I think I read uh, also on that Ars Technica page when I was looking at the site, uh, they had another article here saying that Nintendo hopes to sell two million Switch consoles at launch. So that's that's right. that's a that's a big okay. launch. Okay. Anyway, so I'm done distracting you. <laughs> the other thing you want to talk about: oh, video yeah. game reviews. Yes, reviews. So um, I was I was going to talk about this when we were discussing Civ actually, but. Um, I guess it's more appropriate uh, on the back of Skyrim uh, Rum. special edition, Skyrim special edition, whatever, uh, that Bethesda is not going to be sending out review copies until the day before launch. Now, um, Gus, you said you've already received one. Did you already receive one? Uh, uh, yeah, I did receive one while I was out of town, and I, so I didn't see it for until recently. Yeah, so Bethesda basically came out and said that they they want everyone to experience the game at the same time except for influencers. Yeah, except, except for yeah. me apparently. Um, so I've know, seen so his they, copy, but... Yeah, so like uh, you know, review outlets aren't going to get the game until a day beforehand, but promotional copies for entertainers and Let's Players uh, and Gus hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are all, they've, they've had them for a week. Mm -hmm. Well... <laughs> It, you, here's the the problem with the people reporting on the story is that well it, polygon has a story about it and they're pretty hot under the collar and they absolutely should be because that is their livelihood that is in a sense being threatened by this move it is their job to have those games early and to help people 
in their mind make a decision about whether to purchase it or not. Uh, your average influencer is going to be a lot more lenient on a game because it's just a free game. It's like, hey, someone just gave you this. I didn't buy it. I'm just playing it as something that someone handed me. Um, I'm more inclined to be forgiving of it because it was free to me. Yeah, and in the end, at the end of the day, they're critical. not going to assign a number to it. Right. Um, so, but the the people that are objecting the harshest against this are also the people with the vested interest in discouraging that future from coming to be. Right, exactly, because it's the, the people that are the most upset by it, from what I can tell, are the people who no longer have reviews up a week in advance, which is when you reviews really matter like that's mm -hmm. when people care yeah uh, just you know for the no for example we don't do reviews ourselves we do roundups on reviews we'll say like this was the general consensus across reviews these are the points that keep coming up so this is clearly a, a you know a consistent issue uh despite the reviewer despite the, the specific outlet you know but what we don't like if one of those like if reviews start popping up after a game comes out we generally don't do those roundups because no one cares. No one's going yeah. to watch them. Um, people care about reviews before a launch, and then after a launch, it's word of mouth, it's user reviews, it's not professional review outlets anymore. But I will say, I do still use reviews. Reviews still are helpful to me to determine like when I'm going to buy a game or not. Like Leading up to its release, I was really excited about Mafia 3, everything I'd seen for it. And then, you know, right when it came out, that's when you started seeing kind of mediocre reviews for it. Mm -hmm. and I, I ended up not buying it. Yeah. So uh, there is value in those reviews for people who want to know, you know, whether or not they want to spend money on something. But I also think it's an opportunity for gamers to change the way game sales are done. Because if people, if like if gamers, if that review score is important to know whether or not it's worth buying, it's probably worth like waiting a, a couple of days until... Look what you've done. I did. Yeah, it's empty though. Uh, and to like waiting until those those professional reviewers and critics have have their time with the game, and you can also while the professional critics are getting their thoughts in order and published, then you've also got user reviews to go off of, and you can draw a more complete picture. The the this entire argument seems to be based off how important is day one. Yeah, and I, I don't think that your pre-order crowd as a, as a whole is really that concerned with what the reviewers think. They're, they pre-ordered it before the reviewers. Yeah, they're done. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I w and again, I will say that the, the article on Polygon went and uh, had raised some really good points. Um, most specifically that, or most importantly, I think, from what I took from it was it is going to encourage an atmosphere amongst re reviewers that the first one out the door is going to win, which it will, the first person that gets their review up is gonna get the most traffic, which will discourage more in-depth look at the games, Correct. which, I mean, can, again, that that does, I can see the logic of how that works out for the game developers, because a more superficial look at the game means that more stuff Well, lots missed. of times with a bigger game, you're not gonna have time to finish the game. You'll receive mm -hmm. it and you know, if the game has a midnight launch or you unlocks at midnight if you've downloaded it, you know, you have just hours to try to get through and uh, give an opinion of a game. There's no way on most games you'd be able to finish it and really get a, a thorough look at it. They're giving precedent to the, or, or preferential treatment essentially to the reviews that will go up with the least amount of information. Yes. Right, but in, you know, to some degree, I feel like that's also on the reviewers. They, you know, a lot of them are kind of like getting on their high horse, like, you know, our readers depend on us for this and we're going to be forced to put out, you know, these s sloppy reviews. No one's forcing you to put out sloppy reviews. If it is actually that important for your users or for your viewers to get your opinion, they will wait. The but they, you know, they act like they're being forced to mm -hmm. suddenly rush the reviews because, oh God, they, they depend upon us and how will they ever make a decision without us? What, what they really mean is, oh God, they're gonna make a decision without us. Hey, how do we and live? How do, yeah, like how are we gonna get in on this? And so they're more or less just agreeing that speed is more important to, and like the speed and getting the views is more important to them than actually critiquing the game. I will say that the kind of the flip side of this is, uh, with the, the the way that reviews are built right now, I've lost my where I was going. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> did you drink, did you drink too much Skyrim before you came so. here? I think so. I'm too, too Skyrumed out. You're too Sky drunk? Uh, oh, I got, I got it back. You I got it back. It. I went there. Okay. So the way the, the current, current review atmosphere is, there's sort of a pressure put on game journalists to deliver a view that keeps them getting the early access to the games. Mm -hmm. So they want to say the negative things, but they also want to keep having this early window, and if they say too many negative things, uh, maybe they don't get the next game early, and then they don't get those views. So this could potentially engender a more honest review atmosphere where everybody's going to get it at the same time. There is no preferential treatment any longer for the people inclined to give you a better score. Uh, now you can just let them have it. Like, whatever you feel about that game, that's what you write. You know, there's uh, there's another element to this whole discussion as well, which is that the fact that they are sending out games to Let's Players and entertainers rather than professional critics shows that they're going... And this is this is kind of parallels the move to things like, you know, Nintendo Direct and streaming E3 keynotes and, well, pretty much every keynote... Um, as as game developers and publishers rely less on games media to reach an audience and they have more of a direct connection. Mm -hmm. You know, most announcements are made for, like from Twitter or from the developer's own like blog or website or during a live stream that that anyone can watch. There is like there's you know the media isn't a gatekeeper anymore and gamers have largely turned to you know let's plays and gameplay and you know, that's I think reflected in this mm -hmm. move. Like they just don't see as much of a benefit in reviews anymore. Yeah, Review, like yeah. the game companies are like, we don't really need you. The yeah, less players are just going to hit it honest, and they're going to mock it, and I they're, they're going to have fun with it. They may be more forgiving. Yeah, you know. But and of course, we're biased because we have a we lot do. of people who do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, and confidentially, I've spoken with other uh, people who work who are high up at AAA game studios who say who s echo this exact sentiment that you're saying that they do not see the value that reviews add anymore, that really they see the value in community and in having, you know, a dedicated fan base. And even not Let's Players necessarily, they were also talking about, like, even if it's just a small Twitch channel with someone who has, like, a, a, a small but super dedicated following to that mm -hmm. game, you know, that's just as beneficial, if not more so. That's that's a group of people that will build up a positive vibe about something because mm -hmm. they're they, they, they are the people that are passionate about it and will enjoy it, and their enjoyment of it We'll encourage other peoples to try it, or other people to try it. Yeah, and peoples, other, other peoples, peoples yeah. other lands, all other the, nations. All the other peoples do the things. Uh, yeah, so I just, you know, it's a bit of a shift. I agree that um, there is a certain lack of accountability within, um, you know, within the, the Let's Play and entertainment audience because that's not, like, you know, the, the entertainers are making no pretensions about that. They entertain, like, playing games. They will have a great time with it or make fun of it. Whatever is going to make the best, most entertaining content, and that has nothing to do with, you know, I don't know, like the the mm -hmm. theoretical, like media restrictions on ethics in mm -hmm. reviews and stuff like that. Although it's not as though traditional outlets are trusted nearly as much uh, anymore. With that, a lot of people just don't trust reviews because they do have a close and ongoing relationship with game developers. You know, with the advertising and all that sort of stuff. And it's, you know, I one of the reasons that uh, I'm happy that we don't really do reviews as such is that I think we admit that we all have inherent bias. You know, mm -hmm. Rooster Teeth as a whole, doing work with Battlefield, we've done work with Bethesda on Fallout 4, and, you know, we have those things. And I can't pretend that they don't impact to some degree, I, like, our, our I, outlook I, on, on titles. I think we have always been straightforward when and like here we very clearly like the battlefield for example like we very clearly say when mm -hmm. something is is mm -hmm. a, a sponsored thing you know there's not that i don't know there's not the, the like, gray hidden, it's not hidden yeah, at all yeah that, that hidden side of things so I, I'm, I'm i'm grateful for that which is and again it's also good that we don't I'll, actually do reviews <laughs> yeah and also honestly like i just you know i like enjoying games and typically if, I like, I like if games. I, yeah, if I don't like a game, I'm probably not going to play it long enough to talk about it. And mm -hmm. the most I'll say is like, nah, I gave up on that shit. Wasn't having a good time. Or, uh, you know, 2K gave me my Steam Cloud saves. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, I think that, that we like liking games. Mm -hmm. no, and I'm, I've liked games forever. And so uh, I'm a big fan of games. 
Big fan. Even Big though fan. I've yes, even, though, even though I haven't played much here recently. Yeah. I also, honestly, I feel like uh, with the shift to video entertainment, is it, it's like a huge reason that we've gone very much in the direction of like gameplay videos and stuff like that. People can watch that and see what the game is mm -hmm. rather than reading a bunch of words of someone trying to describe it to them. They can watch you play and then decide for themselves if they want to do what they see you doing. Yeah, it's right. funny you say that because a tweet just came in. Who is this? From Robin England who said, Watching episode one of a Let's Play tells me a lot more about whether or not I'd personally enjoy a game than a review ever would. Yeah. yeah. You, you actually you see it in action. You see what it does and you see how someone else plays it. And sometimes that's more of an incentive because you can say, I can do way better than what they just did. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, there's also I like, hear that a lot. it is a double edged sword because. You know, all the, like all the preview hype for something like No Man's Sky was super, super positive and like really, really up there. And then the reviews finally started hitting along with the user reviews and everything else going this. Like even the reviews were like, this is not what was expected. Uh, and had those come out earlier, fewer people might have chosen to spend their money well, there. It's interesting but everyone was caught up. It's interesting you use that example because I talked a little earlier about how I didn't end up getting Mafia 3 because the reviews were mixed. Mm -hmm. I think if I'd seen reviews earlier, I probably would not have picked up No Man's Sky, but I probably liked No Man's Sky more than most people. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed my time playing for, that game. For well, you went into it, it without preconception. Right. Well, you, I mean, you, came, seen you only some took of the hype. what you personally felt about it into right. the game. So which I was, I was, it can I, become a negative atmosphere. Yeah, I was happy at the end. Yeah. I, I wish it wasn't a $60 game. I wish I'd paid less for it. But I was, I was based on the number of hours I spent and the amount of enjoyment I got out of it, I was fine with it. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's about time to wrap up, I think. It so is. make we, up we, your we own gotta, mind, Internet. We've got to send you off to go, go do YouTube primetime. Go, go check out the YouTube primetime stream. Featuring Achievement Hunter and me as soon as I burst out of this room and sprint across to the other building. Ready? <laughs> All right. And thanks for watching, Pew! everybody.